I think we're all here, so um, we can resume or open the, open the hearing. Um, just to reintroduce myself, um, I'm Paul Griffiths, um, along with my colleague Simon Barclay. We're the, the inspectors who are appointed by the Secretary of State under Section 20 of the uh, Planning Compulsory Purchase Act 2004, as amended, to independently examine the City of York Local Plan 2017 to 2033. Um, you will all have met or been in touch with Carol, our uh, programme officer. I think, Carol, you have some housekeeping matters that you, you need to address. Uh, regarding fire tests, there's no scheduled fire test uh, set for during the examination. So if the alarm does sound, please make your way to the nearest exit and gather on the corner of Claremont Terrace outside the JMB building, it, which is to your left as you go out of the main door. Do not stop to retrieve any belongings, but exit the building as quickly and safely as possible following the fir green fire exit routes. And do not enter the building until a fire marshal or member of the fire service tells you it's safe to do so. Door security. Um, please only use the main doors at the front to access and exit the building. Um, if, for security purposes, the side doors um, should only be used for wheelchair access and only if someone is available to unlock and relock the door on exit. Uh, just to also make you aware that the building is in use by other users, so there may be other people about in the building. Um, the toilets are situated on the ground floor, go down that corridor. Um, the drinking water available around the table, or if you're in the gallery, there's some water in the, the foyer. Um, there's also other refreshments that are available to purchase on uh, Gillygate. There's coffee shops and places to eat. And there's also a Sainsbury's Express in Bootham. Um, just to remind people that these sessions are all being filmed. So if anyone has any issues with being on, on film, if you could get in touch with me, I can make sure that you're sat somewhere where you're not picked, picked up. Um, and Wi-Fi, it's Citadel Guest and the password is General Booth 1883 and that is on the posters either side of the, the room. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, as most of you will know, or probably all of you will know, um, our task as inspectors is to consider whether the plan uh, meets the requirements of the Planning Compulsory Purchase Act 2004 associated regulations and uh, given when it was submitted, whether it is sound in the context of the now otherwise superseded 2012 version of the NPPF. I'm not going to go through the, through the test of soundness. You'll be, you'll be familiar with all of those. As far as uh, these particular hearing sessions are concerned, we're now in um, phase four. Um, the intention is to deal with um, green belt boundaries, inner green belt boundaries today and tomorrow before moving on to, um, or back to OAN and jobs resulting from the University of York. Um, that's Thursday. Next week, um, we have the University Day on Monday um, before moving on to transport and air quality and then back to Greenbelt Boundaries um, on the Thursday and the Friday. Green infrastructure and then Greenbelt policies and placemaking design, heritage and culture. So it's quite a full week next week, I'm free. Um, the week after, um, matter eight, economy and retail, environmental matters on the, the Wednesday, uh, a number of other general policy matters on the afternoon uh, before, um, hopefully we finish on the Thursday with general development management policies. We do have a reserve day on the September the 23rd, but um, I'm hopeful we won't, won't be needing that. Um, the hearings, as you'll all know, um, but I'll go over it, will take the form of a structured discussion that we shall, we shall lead, generally following the matters and issues paper that's been circulated uh, some time ago. Now, there are no separate agendas. I'm, I'm going to invite the Council to make an opening statement, uh, and after that, we'll invite people to speak at particular times. If you have something to contribute, the usual um, rules apply about putting your nameplate on, on end. Um, I must apologise because I still don't have a a replacement pair of glasses for, the, for those that I lost in phase three. Um, so if I do struggle a little bit, it's because I, I can't see a nameplate, so for, forgive me in advance. Um, yes, a, a couple of points we wanted to make about the nature of this, this discussion uh, 
today. What, what we're interested in dealing with in, in very simple terms is, is where the line is drawn, where the boundary of the green belt is drawn on the map. Um, what we're after is looking at whether those lines are drawn in places that are, that are reasonable. Um, I could probably use it. Well, yeah, let's stick with reasonable, whether, the, whether those positions on the map are reasonable. I'm not, we don't want to cover methodology and the ins and outs of how it's been arrived at unless it bears specifically on where the, the, the line is drawn on the map. But we, we've dealt with methodology in, in previous sessions, so I don't, don't want to go over all that territory again. So essentially, we're concentrating on lines on maps uh, today and, and tomorrow and at, when we come to these green belt boundaries next week. So um, I've got nothing else I want to say, Sam. Um, I'll hand over to the council, Mr. Linus. Thank you, sir. I think you've effectively done uh, my opening for me uh, after hearing that, sir. First things first, you asked for uh, a hard copy of the boundary sections. Um, we have uh, an A4 version of the boundary sections that I uh, mentioned uh, before the examination opened. We've done that here in this room. We can get this blown up to A3, but we thought we'd give you that in the meantime, given that we're, given that we're starting. So I will um, hand these to you now. And so as you've said, the sessions today and tomorrow are considering inner green belt boundaries and I say this by way of context only that the detailed boundary setting that we're considering in these sessions derives from a methodology that was as you said considered in phase two. Um, as the hearing statement uh, that we produced explains the detail of the inner boundary is the fourth stage of the wider methodology after setting strategic principles in stage one, the scoping of the boundaries in stage two, channeling development, urban areas and other settlements in stage three. And then this left a shortfall over the plan period available to meet housing requirements, which has been taken into account by the council when setting boundaries that incorporate the need to find allocations. And the supply beyond the urban area reflecting the proposed green belt boundaries exceeds that shortfall, but it does so to ensure that the plan has flexibility to respond to rapid change over the plan period and it ensures permanent green belt boundaries. As for the detailed inner boundaries themselves, stage four of the boundary definition methodology involved applying five criteria which are set out in section eight of the topic paper, that's EXCYC 59. Those criteria were drawn from green belt purposes, taking into account uh, MPPF policy uh, in paragraph 85 of the MPPF to ensure the boundary does not include land which is unnecessary to keep permanently open. And those five criteria were developed into a series of questions that were taken into account when reaching detailed judgments as the detailed inner boundary was developed. Uh, the council also took into account the need for permanence and boundary setting, including clear and defensible physical green belt boundaries, as well as consistency with the local plan strategy. And as you mentioned, sir, these matters have been explained in earlier phases including those dealing with methodology. Green belt boundary matters were also raised in relation to allocations in phase three. Again, we don't propose to repeat the detail of what we said before. Um, to the extent that uh, the university is to be considered further, any points that need to be made in relation to ST27, the associated boundary can be picked up next week as part of that session. As for the, the boundary setting exercise, in defining and assessing the inner green belt boundaries, the area is split into eight sections, the first four of which will be covered today, and these are located on the, broadly on the west side of York. Detailed assessments are set out in Annex 3 of the topic paper, Part 1. Other sections, as I said, will come tomorrow. They're on the east side of York, and the detailed assessments for those sections are set out in Annex 3, Parts 2 and 3. Now, within each section, each stretch of boundary consists of a physical feature or several features which are readily recognisable and permanent. The boundaries differ in length or uh, the number of features, but this reflects the characteristics of the land extending from the proposed boundary. And as we said in the hearing statement, alternative boundaries were considered, 
where there were thought to be more than one potentially defensible boundary, and the justification for excluding alternatives is clearly explained in the annexes. Um, as we confirmed during the Phase 2 hearings for Matter 7, every stretch of the boundary raised through representation was visited. However, the full length of the boundary may not have been visited, for example, where it was not possible to access parts, but it was instead possible to view most of the boundary from one or more points along it. And the boundary setting, as we now propose, is a product of work not only of the Council officers, but Arup as independent consultants who appear today. Jane Healy Brown sits next to me from Arup, and she's able to address points raised about the boundary stretches that are made by objectors. Um, a few other introductory points from me. First is that we recognise there is an element of professional judgment involved in the identification of boundaries. In any exercise of this nature, there will be areas where there is legitimate scope for debate as far as detailed judgments on a stretch of boundary are concerned. Um, we have reviewed the hearing statements and, in respect of the York Sports Club, which is Section 4, Boundary 1A, we do see some merit in proposing an amendment to a short element of the boundary there, which we can explain uh, in due course. Beyond that, we recognise that beyond any debate in the coming sessions, some of these decisions will involve you essentially taking the different lines that have been proposed, visiting the sites where you think appropriate and taking a view. Um, the second point is that um, there is some broad concern that has been expressed about the boundary being drawn too tightly, for example, including, uh, not including white land. Now, as I said, a lot of this has been covered essentially in earlier uh, sessions. Um, as we have explained before, we have had regard to strategic development needs, including housing, and after taking into account the capacity of the urban areas, we are proposing boundaries that allow for headroom and meeting, in particular, the housing requirements, as well as catering for needs beyond the planned period, so that safeguarding land is not necessary, whilst ensuring that the boundaries are consistent with local plan strategy. So, we say the boundaries reflect, therefore, a flexible approach to meeting needs, but this has already been considered, as I have mentioned, as part of earlier phase hearings. Uh, the third introductory point is a number of the reps refer to consideration of alternative boundaries. Um, we have looked at alternative boundaries, um, and we can debate the specifics of those as we go through individual um, objections as part, of, as part of these hearings. Unless there is anything that Ms Healy Brown wants to add to that, that is all I was proposing to say in opening, sir. Thank you, Mr Linus. Um, what we propose to do is, is just go through the, bed, uh, through the proposed boundary um, section by section, um, starting with section one. So, does anyone have anything they want to deal with that is covered in section one? And just one thing that I wanted some clarification on, um, because otherwise I could get quite confused. So um, the, the large colour A3 ones that you're saying throw away, put to one side, I think those are taken from Annex 3, are they? And then these ones, because I noticed, like, first of all, um, Section 1, Boundary 1, which is um, the, the boundary around Hog Pond, um, for example, um, it is different on on this plan um, to the, the one that you are now saying set aside. So, Thank you, sir, because it's drawn. The one we've handed to you re recently is the one that's drawn from Annex Three. So that's the most up-to-date plan. The one that's entirely in black and white without the colour without the colour shading. So, if you, you if in Annex Three one turns to Section One. Um, of the boundary, um, that, is the, that is the plan that is shown, which is the A4 version that we have. Um, I'm not sure that's right, um, because I'm looking. I've got Annex Three here in front of me, and I'm looking at Section One, Boundary One, um, which, as I say, is Boundary of Hog Pond, um, and the boundary there in Annex Three um, sort of goes around the pond, um, in effect, placing the pond in the green belt. Whereas the, the black and white um, printout that, that you've handed to us this morning um, doesn't do that. I, 
don't think. Yes, sir. Just bear with us, sir. Yes, sir. Hope, hope, if one looks at in the annex at Annex Three uh, Colon Five, uh, the boundary that we sh there's a there's a boundary that's uh, shown on the detailed. Uh, section of the analysis for that boundary section on the hog pond, and there's a red line shown on a uh, on an aerial photo, uh, which matches uh, a red line that's shown on a on a map as part of the detailed section on Annex 35. And then, if one looks back to Annex 3, page 2, which is the section 1 map, uh, a copy of which we put into A4 and handed to you. That appears to be consistent with the boundary that's shown for Hog Pond on page A35. Be absolutely clear that yes. we're looking at the same document first of all. Um, I've got, rightly or wrongly, I've called up EXCYC 18D. No, it's 59. It's 59. Oh, that's my fault, mate. Yes, it's the latest. It's the late, that was the earlier topic paper, sir. Forgive me. I think, to be frank, I think the mistake, we probably confused you because I suspect, although we haven't checked, that the plans that were handed out to you originally were from the earlier version of the topic paper and not the latest version that was produced after your letter. Okay, is that the point you were going to make? Or? Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, my name's Thorfinn Caithness, Edwardson Associates. Um, we supported the council's proposal to exclude Hog Pond from the Greenbelt boundary, so as long as that's still the case, I've got nothing further to add. But if we're now yes. proposing to include Hog, yes. Hog's Pond within yes. Greenbelt, then yeah. I know, from past, I know from past experience, sir, that the EXCYC18 reference, I think, is the earlier version of the topic paper. No, well, I think... At part, least we've both made the same <laughs> error. Yes. Um, so, just to be clear, it should be 50C, is that, is that right? 59C for Annex C, for Annex 3, sorry. It's in the EXCYC59 suite of documents is the latest topic paper. Okay, I have that. Thank you. I, I hope we can breathe some sigh of relief on this side of the room, at least. Yeah, I think that's all our fault. Okay. So no, forgive no. me. No, no. Um, <laughs> that's what going on holiday no, does to you. No, well, I, I think, well, the, the plans that were initially produced for you were drawn from the same documents that you're looking at, so I think that there's a hand being held up on this side of the room as well, sir. Is there, is there anything else? Now we're all on the right um, document. Um, does anyone have anything they want to say about um, inner boundary section one? In which case, let's go on to inner boundary section two. Does anyone have anything about, about that boundary? Section three, then. Oh, I am sorry. Go on. Thank you. Emma Winter from Carter Jonas on behalf of LNQ Estates. Um, you'll have seen that we've obviously submitted a hearing statement um, which relates to the inner boundary um, in this particular section, too. Our concerns really relate that there hasn't been any alternative alternative boundaries assessed in relation to this particular area of land. I won't repeat what we've put within our statement, but some of it does relate back to issues with regards to the methodology that we have discussed in earlier matters. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, in relation um, to this location, um, 
no suitable alternative boundaries were identified. Consideration was given to extending to the outer ring road, um, but, and that was considered and is set out in the assessment. Um, but it makes it clear that that would, um, whilst be a stronger boundary, um, would be substantially beyond um, the urban area, would represent unacceptable sprawl. Um, and furthermore, it would have impact on um, Napton, um, which has now been made a washed over village, so the impact would be uh, even greater. So there was consideration of alternative, the only other meaningful would be the outer ring road, but it was substantially different. Ms. Winter, was there anything you wanted to add? No. Okay. Well, we've we've got your statement, obviously. So we'll we're aware of what you um, the suggestion you made and the points you you've made. And I've heard the the council's answer about that. Fine. Anything else in um, section two? Oh, sorry. Go on. So, if I may, Thomas Pilcher, Pilcher Homes. Um, I just wanted to reply to Jane Healy Brown's comment there, where she says that the only alternative they've considered is going out to the ring road. I, I don't think that's actually true. If you look on page 26, they refer to site 317. I'll give you a moment to find it. And that is relevant to when we're looking at boundaries three, four, five, and six. And that would fill in up to Ascom Lane, and that's actually quite a different boundary than going to the Ring Road. And we're still quite a long way away from Napton at this stage. So my, my point is just that the City of York have just said then that they've only considered going up to the Ring Road, but actually, in their document here, bottom of page 26, Section 1, Boundary 3, they've considered Site 317, which is another sort of logical, clearly identifiable boundary. Sorry, just to get your, the reference correct, um, is that page, page 26 of the, the Greenbelt Boundary document that we were talking about just now? E yes, okay. on their EXC 59C Annex 3, Section 1, Boundary 3, if you follow it down to A326, yeah, I've got it. they do look at obviously what is a you know, common sense sort of other alternative area that doesn't go out to the ring road. So that's correct, but that's a different section of this boundary. I was just referring to the section that we were discussing previously, if that helps. Clarify. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, Mr. Pilcher, um, if, if you could just hold, hold your um, eagerness to talk about um, boundaries three to six just for a moment while okay. we, we'll finish with boundary two. But I'm, I understand the point that you're making. Happy to move to move on. Is there anything else in two? In a boundary section two. In a boundary section three then. Move on to four. Okay, Mr. Robinson. Thank you. <clears throat> Tom Robinson, JLL, representing NHS Property Services. I know Mr. Linus has already mentioned York Sports Club, <clears throat> to which our representations relate. So would you like to hear from me first or Mr. Mr. Linus? Okay, thank you. Uh, I note everything you've said about discussing the methodology, uh, and I'll try and keep my comments to um, where it's relevant to this hearing. Mm. I think fundamentally our client is seeking consistency in the application of the, the methodology. Um, we acknowledge that the, the Greenbelt in York is complex and of great importance to all concerned, so it's important to 
to, to get it right and that it endures beyond the plan period. Um, and I note the comments about professional judgment. Um, we acknowledge that's required and, and appropriate and necessary, um, but we just ask that it's uh, applied consistently and, and not, um, and only where it where it's required, where it um, where the methodology can't uh, deal with the matter at hand. So that uh, turning to the lime tree site, which is adjacent to the York Sports Club, um, section four, boundary one A, we'd make the the following points. Um, in the in the council's hearing statement for this matter at 1.2.2, uh, um, they state that in relation to the inner green belt boundaries, strategic principle SP4 states that the starting point for the scoping of the York green belt, detailed inner boundary, should be the edge of the main contiguous urban area of York, where built development meets more open land, and that's a reference back to uh, paragraph 6.22 of CYC 20, topic paper one. Uh, as we set out in our in our submissions, the lime trees buildings and the sport clubs buildings uh, are contiguous with the urban form of York, heading north along Shipton Road. There's no meaningful gap or obvious halt in development on the southwest side of the road between residential buildings, the sports club, and lime trees. The sports club and lime trees form a continuation of the urban form, which ends beyond the lime trees site. Development continues on the opposite side of the road to the sports club and lime trees, so the sports club and lime trees would not jut out into the green belt. Uh, and the council, <coughs> excuse me, in reviewing the green belt boundaries in, or, or preparing evidence in 2021, uh, made an amendment at 27 Shipton Road next to the sports club, um, setting out that that should be outside the green belt, but hold the revision there. So recognising that the urban form of Shipton Road went up to the edge of 27 Shipton Road, but didn't continue beyond that point. And there doesn't seem to be an ob obvious logic in stopping at that point, given that the built form continues northwards. Uh, in halting at 27 Shipton Road, um, they then made a further revision further north at Clifton Moor Hospital, thus taking a significant site out of the proposed green belt. Um, to admit lime trees in the sports club lacks consistency on this point. Uh, uh, for, sorry, for, for, forgive me, Mr. Robinson. Um, so we, we are currently on, <laughs> it gets a bit confusing this, uh, but this is section one, a. boundary four. Sorry, um, section four, boundary one. I a. think you're talking about section four, boundary one. Yeah. Which is not where we are yet. I apologize. Uh, so, yeah, C can I? It's a, I was absolutely prepared to be told that I was in the wrong place, absolutely. But, uh, no, apparently you're right, um, and um, I'm completely off track. That's a first, but I'll, I'll, I'll take it. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so the council suggests that because the sports club and lime trees are in different uses to the adjacent residential properties, this justifies, just, excuse me, this justifies the former being put into the green belt, uh, the sports club that is. The council set out that because the sports club buildings are linked to the outdoor pitches, the buildings should be in the green belt, as the pitches should be. And the council goes on to reason that because the sports club buildings should be in the green belt, so should lime trees, as lime trees would not be contiguous with the urban form. But this inconsistently applies the council's methodology. The methodology does not set out in clear terms that a building in a different use but contiguous with other development triggers consideration of whether contiguous development should be in the green belt. The council elsewhere disassociated, disassociates open land, which should reasonably be in the green belt, with associated buildings, which the council reasons should not be in the green belt. And examples include um, section four, boundary 10, the Burton Green School, where the school buildings are to be out of the green belt, but the, most of the playing pitches and car parks and so on are to be in the green belt. Similarly, section three, boundary nine, St. Peter's School, the same uh, applies to playing pitches outside the green, uh, in the green belt, and the buildings themselves not. And then at other ma major sites uh, in York, such as the retreat, where the building itself is taken out of the green belt, but the grounds, which are clearly part of the setting and, and associated with the building, must be in the green belt. So a building's use and its association with adjacent open space is not sufficient reason to include the building itself within the green belt. Um, the sites are developed with substantial buildings, car parking, and so on. Um, so including the site in the green belt would not serve to keep the, the site open. Lime trees and the sports club buildings have been in existence for some time. I sat out in the statement, lime trees appears in the ordnance survey maps from the 1930s, so it's not the result of recent urban sprawl. 
The site includes a significant number of trees, many of which are subject to TPOs. Any development of the site would not, were it not in the green belt, could be appropriately controlled uh, by normal development management policies. Uh, the suggestion at page A3268 of the Council's evidence that if development is not checked in this location, where a distinction between urban, where, sorry, if the development is not checked at this location, where a distinction between urban and recreational uses can be made, development could easily connect up along the road, gradually expanding the urban edge. We do not accept this as a land beyond the uh, undeveloped and proposed, <clears throat> excuse me, we not, do not accept this because the land beyond is undeveloped and proposed to be part of the green belt. In any case, this argument would be true of any boundary area. There's no risk of development creep in this location, or there's no greater risk of development creep at this location more than anywhere else in a, at a, in a green belt boundary site in the city. The council has not demonstrated why normal planning management policies, sorry, while normal planning and development management policies are set out in paragraph 82 of the MPPF um, would not um, manage development here. Um, sites should not be pre uh, protected or prevented from development for the sake of it. As JLL said at previous hearings, the local plan should allow sites to sit outside the green belt um, and sit as white land, which may bring forward future development opportunities as windfall sites. These form part of the building and uh, the housing supply for the local plan. Um, amended green belt boundary at, amending the green belt boundary at lime trees and elsewhere could assist with windfall sites, um, such as small sites within the urban boundary. As demonstrated in the LVIA submitted in our reps, the site is capable of being developed without detrimental impact on the green belt. Um, I think that concludes everything. I apologise, I've been trying to edit it in my head uh, as, as I go along, recognising Mr Linus has, um, has some comments to make. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I think this point demonstrates why we should get you an A3 version, because we're looking at boundary section 1A, and I think a larger um, version of this plan would, would help uh, clarify the area that we're talking about. But in the meantime, to assist, this section of the boundary is dealt with uh, in Annex 3, and it's, it goes from pages 263 uh, down to uh, 271. Uh, um, in short, we accept that there is a consistency point here, but we don't go as far as Mr. Robinson would like us to. And I can ask Ms. Hedy Brown to explain our position, please. Thank you. So, yes, we, we partially agree with Mr. Robinson in terms of the consistency point. Um, and you'll remember, sirs, from uh, phase three, where we were looking at a number of similar locations, including the two barracks and St. Peter's School. Um, and so the council is proposing uh, a modification which would bring the boundary to exclude from the green belt the buildings at the sports club. And we believe that would be consistent with those other um, sites that I've just referred to. Um, however, we don't believe it would be appropriate to exclude the lime trees from the green belt. Um, it is substantially different from the sports club. Um, in that it is set further back from the road, is less visible from the road um, than the sports club, um, is in an open setting and therefore has um, contributions to the green belt um, in terms of openness. So it is proposed that that boundary would go to um, the rear of the curtilage of the sports club, wrap around that and come back through to the main road. I'm not sure, do we have a plan? Not before the examination. We can prepare that, uh, sir, and put it in front of the examination uh, as soon as we can. Um, Sorry. So just to, uh, to respond to a couple of specifics as well, just for completeness. Um, uh, Mr. Robinson referred to the issue of white land. Obviously, we talked about that from a methodological point of view in phase two, so I don't propose to expand on that further. Um, and in terms of the point that was raised about the extension of the urban area up the road um, and how it was open, I would say, looking at the inner boundary map you've been provided, you can then see how it is very urbanised along boundary 1B. Thank you. 
I, th I think what, what we need to do here is when we have a, uh, a mid-morning break, if, if the map is ready, that probably does need to be shared with Mr. Yes. Robinson. So, Mr. Robinson, you can have a look at it and then tell us what you, what you think of the change the Council proposes. Or is, that, is that fair? I, I, I think, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to have a look at the map, but if, as I'm understanding it correctly, the, the, the new line would wrap around the sports buildings um, and exclude lime trees, but that would extend the urban area northwards and you'd have a developed site immediately north of the Greenbelt boundary, so a developed site lying within the, within the Greenbelt. So that would move the defined urban form of York slightly further north, but you'd still have the same issue of a, a developed site immediately next to the urban form of York, in the, but, but lying within the Greenbelt. Lime trees, and I'll, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the visual impact assessment that we submitted, has some very strong um, defensible boundaries of mature trees um, and, and I say a, a clearly developed site that would sit immediately next to the green belt, green belt boundary but in the green belt which doesn't seem to be logical. And given I appreciate I'm more familiar with the site and you might appreciate the opportunity to look at the, the amended plan before coming back on that. Yes, I think that's probably... So we, 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 right. we can do that. Um, uh, we can share something with Mr. Uh, Robinson in the, uh, in the break. Uh, he can have an opportunity to comment on that and then we can produce that to the examination. Just picking up on one final point, obviously, uh, insofar as he says the mature tree would act a defensible boundary, our case is that that's one thing that distinguishes the lime tree site because of its uh, relative openness. And I think that's really the crux of the difference between the two of us on that, but it's, it's a matter for your judgment, obviously. Sorry, bear with me a moment, Mr. Robinson. I just want to look something up in your hearing statement and my. My machine is being a little slow. Okay, I'm understanding the point. I'm understanding the point. I think what we'll need to do is come back when you've, you've had a look at the Council's map. Um, Mr Pilcher, um, I think you might want to, we might need to go back given, given, um, given where we've got to. Uh, you might want to um, go back to the, the points you were making. Yeah, apologies for that. That was uh, my fault entirely in misunderstanding precisely where we were. So, okay, um, yeah, yeah, sorry if I cut you off early, Mr Pilcher. No, that, that's absolutely fine, sir. Um, Similarly, I think I jumped in assuming we'd already finished talking about boundary two. I, th I think when we come back to inner boundary section one, three, four, and five, I think they're all very similar. You know, I mean, you could have drawn that just as one line. You could have called that all boundary three if you wanted to. Uh, and my point that I made obviously misinterpreting what Jane Healy Brown was saying is that, that they'd considered going to the ring road Obviously, they have considered other potential boundaries, which would create, uh, create um, I think, more than a medium-sized site up to Ascombe Lane. And I think that's, I think my point would just be that they have considered something, and it's for you to make your judgment about whether that might have been a better boundary. It might have been an opportunity to um, positively prepare a plan to seek to deliver a significant increase in the supply of housing, potentially. Obviously, it's land that's deliverable, because uh, I know that people have been promoting it. Although no one seems to be here specifically for it today. I think we'll, it'll be on our site visits list, obviously, so um, can't really 
do anything until we've done site visits, but yeah, I'll, I'll make sure it's on there. Has, has anyone else been um, left out as a result of my whisking through these boundaries? No. Um, I think we got to in a boundary section four. So does anyone have anything they want to, to add beyond what Mr. Robinson has, has said to us? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sir, Martin Johnson. Just checking on, we're on, we're on in a boundary section one, not section four. Uh, I'm waiting to have a conversation about section one boundary 10. I'm not missing it here, am I? Um, I think you're making the same mistake that I did. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps the confusion is that when you look at the annexes, part one relates to sections one to four, part two relates to sections five to six, and part three relates to section seven to eight. Um, effectively, for, for current purposes, the parts of the annex don't count as the, it's the sections that we're looking at. So we understood that we were in section four. <laughs> If you have something you want to say about section one, then please go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sir. It's obviously, my misunderstanding as to the, 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 where, where we're getting to on this one. Um, I, I have a, I'm, I'm here on behalf of KCS Developments, who've got a potential site or a promotional site in section one alongside boundary 10. And we've submitted represent, written representations to that. So there is actually a statement in there today. Um, our comment, criticism, calling what you were and not necessarily going back to the methodology, is the way in which boundary number 10 has been identified and described almost as if it's a single entity uh, field. Now, just to assist that point, is that I'm looking at Annex 3, page 70. And if I'm hopefully writing this so you can see the boundary 10, I'll just wait for a moment if that's the case for you to catch. And, and what we can see within the page 70 is that there's an aerial view and you've got a light green field to the top and a darker green field to the south. Our particular comment about this site, um, and I'll come on to the promotional area in a moment, is that it's, it's regarded almost those two fields as a single entity. And in our statement, we've submitted photographs to demonstrate is that whilst the field, the lighter green field to the north, is probably highly visible from the ring road in all areas, is that the landform for the darker green field to the south is such that it, it's not visible at all, in effect, because of the, the way in which the embankment to the, um, to the ring road takes form. And we've made a number of representations over the years, and in, in many respects, we've reduced the size of the promotional area to respect and reflect some of the comments made by the council and its methodology. And if I can just take you briefly to page 76. On page 76, there is a site, a smaller site reference, which is 942. And I'll just I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson, are you working off the PDF page numbers? I am, yes. Right, okay. Okay. Really? Apologies. That's fine. I'm not sure if the inspectors are either, to be fair. Yes. It's not the right page, but it's A370, yes. if, it, if it assists. Right. And in which case, then, on, on PDF page number 76, um, you'll see site 942, which is our reference. And what we've done in our submission statement is that we've actually submitted quite a few photographs to demonstrate boundary 10 and how 942 is not disruptive, not visible in effect from, from the ring road and would make a very logical and sustainable, sustainable urban extension. Our criticism, therefore, is the way in which boundary 10 has perhaps been a little bit to um, general in the identification of certain boundaries. And without going into the detail of what we're proposing by way of circa, circa 90 dwellings, we think we can carve out quite comfortably there a new site 
and accepting the fact that a boundary doesn't currently exist, um, which we, you could regard it as a defensible boundary. But my point about defensible boundaries is that we've already got a number of proposed allocations which don't necessarily conform to defensible boundaries, but defensible boundaries and buffers can be created. So at, at that point, sir, I think I'll rest that point and, and let the council respond. And again, apologize for maybe just moving around between the various sections. Yeah, that's fine, no need to apologize. I think that's largely my fault. Go on, Mr. Linus. Thank you. So um, I think what we can be clear is that the boundary that is proposed is recognizable and permanent. And it is a strong boundary around the edge of the existing urban area. Um, in terms of the two fields that have been referred to on Annex page 83, 64 in the hard copy, um, in terms of openness and performance against Greenbelt, I think that they would be comparable. Um, there would be a case for looking at a further boundary further out if we were looking at an allocation in this location, and therefore this would be a matter of discussion around an emission site, but that is not appropriate for the discussion today. But in terms of the boundary that's proposed, that would be an appropriate boundary. Mr Johnson, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, nothing further, sir. I think I just stand by the point that I've made in that boundary 10, I think, is, is one that could logically be split. And hopefully, if you get the chance to actually view that boundary on your site visit, particularly from the ring road, you'll see how those two fields are distinctly different. So I think it's just a straightforward difference of view. Obviously, when one is div uh, dividing up an extent of inner boundary, judgments have to be reached on the length of each individual boundary section. Ms. Haley Brown's explained why she doesn't think there's a substantial difference between those fields to justify marking one boundary stretch differently from another. And it wouldn't make any difference to the assessment that's been, um, uh, that's been offered in the, in the document. Uh, so we don't, we don't accept uh, uh, Mr. Johnson's point. Thank you. Um, are there any other? I'm, I'm, going to I'm going to open this. I think just not not say a specific section. But are, are there any other um, boundary um, matters that we need to discuss in sections one to four? Let's do it like that. Nothing to add then. Well, what I'm going to so, suggest sorry. we do, oh, Mr. Pilch, go on. So when you say sections one to four, that that would pretty much be the entire day's trip round. Um, yeah, that would be fast, fast moving. Um, my point, I just wanted, yeah, I've got t two minor points. So let's make sure we're all talking about the same thing again. We're in the city of York. It's Acom, the edge of Acom. And uh, we've just been talking about three, four, and we were going to come on to five. And then Mark's taken us up to, to number 10, where he's got a, an interest. But I just wanted to make a point that relates to, to five and six. Um, five and six in which section? So, so section one, right? five and six. Five. Now, I, I have no financial interest in this site, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it's a medium-sized site. It's uh, something that was represented by Savills, and I've just looked through the list and I don't seem to have made a, a representation. It's, there's two different owners. The land is deliverable, and one of the points that they've made in their representations over the last four years, and probably for many decades before, is that the, there's quite a pronounced hill in that area, and I think you probably need to see it from Ascom Lane in that corner, because those two fields which sit below, to the south of uh, six, boundary section one, if you can follow me, those two fields, um, which are in different ownerships, they can't be seen at all from any of the views 
where by chance my office is actually has got the views on that Ascombe, Bryan, Cottonthorpe roundabout, and you look across York, and it's an extremely um, well-contained small medium site. So as a small medium house builder, those are the types of urban fringe sites that had they not been washed out, um, they are the type of thing that would deliver um, sustainable, deliverable, viable, and also a range of sites. You know, so one of the representations I've made in the last four years is that we've got a plan that's very much dominated by, by very large um, dormitory settlements to be built by PLCs with a little snifter of, a, you know, 5% of them should be held by SMEs. But actually some small deliverable sites on the urban fringe might help with our catastrophic housing crisis here in York and our persistent under-delivery of housing. So I think what I, my, my point there would be is that please, when you do do your trips around, obviously you're looking at the, the boundary three, four, five and thinking about whether that whole area would fill in very well. I, I get their point that if that was all filled in, that some of those houses would be quite elevated. And, you know, I, I know it quite well, but the two fields, six and five, which would be dependent basically on just a, a brow of a hill, which I know is not the best boundary, they are promoted, they are deliverable, and you might have a difference of opinion with them. So it's, it's worth looking at. And I don't have any other things to say about seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Mr. Linus. Um, okay, we're just catching up on what was said because I don't think a point was made specifically in the hearing statement about these boundary sections by Mr. Uh, by Mr. Pilter. It seemed to be a broader point. You're correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we're just hearing this for the first time. But just for your notes, sir, I'll, I'll see if Ms. Healy Brown has anything else to say. Uh, if one looks in um, Annex Three, pages uh, A3. This is in the paper version, but A3. Um, 40 uh, through to uh, 46. Um, that includes an assessment, in particular boundary six, which is what Mr. Pilcher has been mainly referring to. And it does uh, consider um, the contribution made by the areas to the, particularly the south of boundary six by reference to the methodology that we have uh, discussed. Um, it also recognises that um, there were other sites proposed, uh, emission sites through. Um, uh, the call for site process, and they're identified on page A346. Uh, but overall, the conclusion was, was reached that it would not be appropriate to shift the boundary further south um, of the boundary that's shown on A340 for reasons that are explained in A341 through to uh, A345. I'd agree with that. I think I'm not hearing uh, a challenge to the boundaries it's been defined. It's more the opportunity if further development land was required for where a uh, boundary further out could be set. Yes, I think that, that accords with what, what I'm hearing. And I think, Mr Pilcher, that's yeah, right, yeah. isn't it? Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The only thing one could potentially add is that we will need exceptional circumstances to come back to take something like that out of a green belt had the City of York followed their 2015 advice and if they were able to get it past the executive, that's the type of thing that could have been um, white land or specifically safeguarded land. You know, because I just want to come back to a phase two, Mr. Natkus made the point that everything in York is treated in a binary way. It's either an allocation, and we better get on with it because we're short, or it's Greenbelt, but Actually, I think the framework correctly applied, it would be inconceivable to think that there shouldn't be some white land or some safeguarded land. You could be one of four things. You could be greenbelt. You could be safeguarded land. You're not coming forwards yet. You know, you might not be in the 30s, you might be in the 2040s, but you're safeguarded. And you could be white land or you could be an allocation and you could be one of four things. And obviously, points that many of us have made is that if we want these boundaries to endure well beyond the plan period, which is, I think 
more than five years. They took the advice, well, they had the advice of 10 years, but I think it needs to be well beyond rather than a constant sniping for our, us developers to keep coming back to stuff over and over. You know, if these boundaries are, are good for the long term, there will be some opportunities and it may well be that when you've looked at these things, you may recommend main modifications to give them an opportunity to have a few little bits of safeguarded land and it won't have an, an immediate impact on the historic character of the city. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So we don't need to um, respond to that in detail. It's a recovering of points that were uh, raised during uh, earlier phases. We've explained why we haven't taken the safeguarded land approach and we've explained uh, uh, why boundaries have been set having regard to the approach taken to housing needs uh, as set out in um, the topic uh, paper. Uh, and updated during the, uh, the summer as far as the housing needs position is concerned. So I don't think we need to add anything to what we said before. Does anyone else have anything about boundaries? Go on. I was just, uh, sorry, Joe Perkins from Banks Group. Uh, I was just going to support Mr. Pincher's points about inclusion of safeguard land, but I think I appreciate that's deviating into uh, methodological. Uh, issues a bit, so I uh, accept the council's point on that. Okay, in which case I don't, I don't think I need to come back to you, Mr. Linus. No. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to add about boundaries? I'm going to suggest that we have a, a break then, um, so that the maps can be produced and you can have a conversation with with Mr. Robinson, and then we can we can resume and we can deal with anything arising from that and anything, um, anything if any, anyone um, has anything they want to add about the boundaries that we've covered this morning uh, rather more quickly than I imagined. But there we are. Good. Um, I've got five past 11, so 15, 20? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll adjourn until 20 past then. Until then. Thank you. Mm -hmm.